So let's talk about glucose spikes, right? So that's when the concentration of blood sugar in your body increases rapidly after you eat. So these carry with them a few consequences that are felt by all the cells in your body, but also by your brain, because your brain feels all the same things. So there are three important mechanisms that you have to know about. Number one is glycation. So when there's a lot of glucose in your body, the process of glycation happens more often and quicker. And glycation is essentially aging, right? So you're, from the moment you're born, you're slowly cooking, which is what glycation actually does to your body. And when you're fully cooked, you die, okay? We're cooking like an, a chicken in the oven from the moment we're born. With every glucose spike, we're increasing the rapidity of that process called glycation, of aging and in the brain as well. We'll dive into it more deeply, but I wanna cover the three ones. Second one, your mitochondria become overwhelmed. So when you give a lot of glucose too quickly to your cells and to your mitochondria, your mitochondria are in charge of turning that glucose into energy. Well, your mitochondria are not super happy. They go on strike when too much glucose comes their way. That leads to oxidative stress. That leads to inflammation in the body. Inflammation is really, really bad and leads to many chronic diseases. The cells in your brain also feel the oxidative stress and the inflammation that glucose spikes make happen. Third, Insulin. So when your body is experiencing a glucose spike, it sends out insulin to take away some of that extra glucose and store it away into storage compartments, essentially. Well, over time, when there's too much insulin in your body, that leads to insulin resistance. That's also felt by your brain. So those are the, like the three main base biochemical mechanisms that happen in your body when you're eating a lot of sugar. After today's video, check out seed. Now, if you're looking at your metabolic health, one of the things that people don't look at is their gut. Okay, our gut diversity, our microbiome, plays a tremendous role in glucose modulation and plays a tremendous role in how our brain functions as well. Like this is not just a talking head on YouTube saying this. There are countless bodies of microbiome research that are backing this up now. And Seed is at the forefront of a lot of microbiome research. So that link down below saves you 15% off Seed's daily symbiotic with a capsule inside of a capsule. If you know me well, then you know that I'm not a big supplement guy. Like seriously, name five supplements that I talk about on this channel. I talk about magnesium, I talk about protein powder, I talk about creatine, and I really don't condone a lot of supplements, but I think for certain people, probiotics might just be the leg up that they need to help their microbiome. So that link's down below in the description. Your turn, Thomas, what okay. happens next? So one thing that I'm aware of is people will actually start to notice changes in their motivational drive, in their mood, literal behavioral changes. And I learned something a few months ago that I found fascinating. And that's the fact that when you start to develop insulin resistance in your brain, yeah. meaning your brain has been so bombarded with sugar that it has essentially become just so accustomed to it that it no longer really responds to insulin. And well. the cells in your brain can no longer uptake that exactly. glucose, yeah. So you've developed insulin resistance. Now, in the brain. In the brain. Okay, and when this happens, it disrupts what is called MAOB. Now, this sounds very complicated, and in a lot of ways it, it is, and it's beyond my pay grade, but the very specific, like the basics of it. Yeah. MAOB is what encourages what's called dopamine turnover. Huh. Okay, so dopamine is the neurotransmitter that is associated with reward. It also helps you feel good. And pleasure. I, yes, and pleasure. But it happens at a very micro scale all the time. And I always say like, if you were, hold out, hold out your finger for a second. If I was to reach out and right before I touch her finger, whoop, <laughs> there's like a surge of dopamine that hits as soon as my finger actually makes contact. Why is that? Because every time there is an equal and opposite reaction, like your brain is giving you a little hit of dopamine to say, Congratulations. Good, good, good behavior. You did it. Continue. You, did it. you yeah. did it. And like since I was waiting and anticipating that touch, oh. that anticipatory when that was completed, dopamine, right? So dopamine's always, always happening. But we need dopamine turnover, which means that the old dopamine is flushed out and it's put back into a cycle so you ultimately create new dopamine. Mm. If dopamine turnover does not occur, then you cannot produce new dopamine and you start becoming less sensitive to dopamine and you start having issues. Okay, so that is how when you become insulin resistant in the brain, it can literally make you less motivated. That's it can literally so impact that entire system. Another consequence of insulin resistance in the brain, so some people call Alzheimer's disease type three diabetes because we're discovering more and more that the old model of like the plaque based model of Alzheimer's is not really complete. It seems that actually Alzheimer's might actually be a metabolic disease. The cells in 
your brain when they become insulin resistant, that's a very clear marker of Alzheimer's. Another thing that happens is that the blood vessels in your brain, because of that oxidative stress, they start getting damaged. And again, that vascular damage is very tightly linked to Alzheimer's. And so you can actually see these effects quite early on. So if in your midlife, so if you're 40 years old, if your glucose levels are more elevated, you have a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's in the future, right? So glucose, insulin, Alzheimer's, dementia, very linked. Another interesting thing is that on a more sort of immediate level, brain fog is a very common consequence of having many glucose spikes and of your brain's response to those glucose spikes. So when there's that inflammation in your brain going on, the speed of the signals between your neurons kind of slows down and that can be felt as brain fog. So you really need to think about your food, your glucose, your insulin to help your brain today for the dopamine, for the brain fog, for the motivation, but also to help your brain long term. Yeah, I, I like to think of that as, like, if you think of your, your neurons as having these beautiful suspension bridges across them, like traffic is yeah. going back and forth and it's great and you've got hundreds of them. It's like when you have inflammation, it's like someone took a rocket launcher and just destroyed that bridge. Jeez. And boom. And then, but more so, a more accurate representation is you have thick fog that is stopping that, right? So when you talk about inflammation, you talk about brain fog. It's not literally a fog, but it can be used as an accurate analogy because it's almost like you have interference that's just disrupting cellular signaling yeah. and you know, neuronal signaling. And with that, that leads to brain fog. That's mm -hmm. exactly so that feeling that you're feeling, although it sounds like an over-marketed hype, like, oh, brain fog, it's a very real thing. Yeah, it's, it's not a slower signal between neurons, you know? And actually, the reason I got into glucose in the first place was because of mental health issues. And I started discovering that the more spikes I was having, the worse my mental health was. I would get these weird episodes of like leaving my body, dissociation, anxiety, depression, really weird stuff. And I started noticing with a glucose monitor that the more spikes I was having, the more those things were happening. And I could almost trigger the episodes of really intense mental health problems with really big glucose spikes. And at that point on, I was like, oh my God, what I'm eating is affecting my brain and how I feel on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. And that changed everything for me. And people don't always realize either that like, when you have these glucose spikes, that is also accompanied by just huge surges in oxidative stress. Yes. Like we, anytime we are utilizing and oxidizing fuel, you have an exhaust, yeah. right? You have a glucose exhaust. And this is true for anything. Uh, you know, they tend to say that, you know, beta oxidation or utilizing fats that burns as a, as a cleaner energy. That is true to a certain degree. Ketones burn as a you know, cleaner energy, but even that is a little bit twisted in how, you, how it can be you know, talked about. But with glucose, there's a highly reactive. It's very oxidative. You have a lot of oxidative stress that happens there. And if you're not taking care of your body, mm -hmm. it can be very difficult to deal with that oxidative stress. So as far as mental illness is concerned, as far as mitochondrial health, yeah. you end up with just this bombardment of what's called ROS, or reactive oxygen species, just oxidative damage. And that just breaks away and chips away at DNA, it chips away at, you at know, the cell walls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're and you left start getting damaged from the inside. It's yeah. exactly. And what's interesting about sugar in the brain is that also because of that dopamine thing, when you eat something sweet, you might feel like, oh, I'm getting all this energy. You know, you feel a little bit like a high for a bit because of the dopamine being released in your brain in response to eating the sugar. So, you know, for a long time, I confused that feeling of high with energy. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, this orange juice, this Nutella crepe, which I ate every morning when I was younger, is giving me energy. But I did didn't realize is that actually what was happening was a big glucose spike, dopamine surge that made me feel a bit high, but actually on the inside, I was really hurting my, long, my body's long-term ability to make energy. So if you're somebody who's eating, you know, sugars and starches all day, but you feel chronically fatigued, yet you're still eating the sugar thinking it's giving you energy, it's time to kind of stop that pattern and to think back, okay, how do I keep my glucose levels steady so that I can actually help my mitochondria make energy efficiently? We have to break out of that uh, common myth that sugar equals energy.